So today um, we'll talk to you about a, a very interesting story that we sort of unexpectedly came upon in the lab and tell you the story behind it. Um, and you know, in science, most of the times you fail. And in baseball season, I've realized that you know, to, to hit three out of 10, um, you know, to hit 300, you're doing pretty well in baseball. So um, I, most of the time you do fail in science. But sometimes you're rewarded with very simple questions in the lab and get a very unexpected answer. So, so um, the topic of my talk today is to really think about what we have sort of colloquially called dark matter of cancer genomics. And what that refers to is in the fact that, in by and large, most of uh, sequencing studies using massively parallel sequencing have largely focused on the exome. And that's generally about the 1% to 2% of the human genome. And to look for the oncogenic mutations and tumor suppressor alleles that have been described in the cancer research literature. One of the questions we wanted to know was, do non-coding regions of the genome uh, contribute to cancer? And there are many uh, difficult challenges to this question, um, one of which is that there are challenges um, both uh, computationally of understanding these regions of the genome that are not easy to interpret. These are large intergenic regions with repetitive stretches of DNA. And what we do know something about, about it, and actually a lot about in terms of a lot of the basic science research that has um, been performed uh, in this field is in promoters and enhancer areas. And you know, these papers recently in the last two years, using systematic approaches to understand uh, non-coding areas of the genome will be very informative to our understanding. And so what we had come upon in the lab is actually a critical mass of whole genome DNA uh, sequencing that we had uh, performed with 25 whole genomes of malignant melanomas. And using that data, and this data was published uh, about a year ago, we asked a very, very simple question. And that question was, are there somatic mutations that occur more than once in these whole genomes in non-coding areas? And much to our surprise, and actually um, much to our surprise so much that we actually didn't believe the data at first, we found that in 17 of 19 of these melanomas that had um, uh, coverage at the TER promoter, that there were two specific mutations within 100 base pairs of the transcription start site. And these two uh, putative somatic mutations we called C228T and C250T for the genomic coordinates and their changes from a cytidine to thymidine. And both mutations we found were mutually exclusive. And they both occurred, as you can see here, about 200 base pairs upstream from the translation start site um, as designated by minus 124 and minus 146. Now, it took a long time, actually, to convince ourselves that, this, uh, that these mutations were real. And I won't bore you with the details, but you know, we essentially performed uh, very traditional Sanger sequencing to confirm that both mutations were indeed present in the tumor, but not in the normal in melanoma samples. And then these are the matched normals for these patients. And when we did an extension cohort, what we found in the end was that 70%, 71% of the melanomas had either one of these two mutations. So, this was an incredibly surprising result to us, um, and um, we were very, you know, were very surprised that this was the actual case, since this was more common than BRAF E600E, and this was, seemed to be the most common, these two mutations were the most common mutations seen yet to date in melanoma. When we looked across our collection for data that which we had BRAF and NRAS mutations, we found that these did co-occur with the NRAS and BRAF mutations. Um, in, in the samples that we looked at. And then what we wanted to do then was determine, you know, what was interesting about these mutations. And, you know, there's very few moments in science when you look at something and you sort of say, wow, there's a moment of sort of eureka. And when I looked at the data and looked at the sequence, what turned out was that both of these mutations created the exact same 11 base pair sequence within the TERP promoter. And embedded within that sequence, was a consensus at its binding site. So this mutation here, C250T, and this mutation here, C228T, both created a consensus at its binding sequence and, in fact, created the same 11 base pair sequence within the TERP promoter. In order to test whether or not these were functional mutations, we used very well-established luciferase reporter systems. I cloned in these mutations into um, a portion of the core, TERP core promoter and then tested them in luciferase reporter assays. And in fact, in, tested them in a bunch of cell lines, actually, that we knew had either TERP promoter, that had TERP promoter mutations in them, and showed that in general, we found that each mutation conferred about a two to four-fold increase 
in transcriptional activity from the Turk promoter. We actually didn't publish this data, but we also showed that when you actually mutagenize the site to a non-consensus that's binding site, noted here, you actually don't increase transcription from the Turk promoter. But actually, when you change it to a C228A, which is also represented by the consensus that's binding site, you still maintain this increase in transcriptional activity from the Turk promoter. We next asked, are these Turk promoter mutations present in other cancer types? Now, I'm sure many in the audience know that Turk uh, telomerase gene is found or is expressed or overexpressed in 90% of cancers. Um, but for a long time, it hadn't been known why they hadn't found mutations yet in, in telomerase. And so we wanted to know were these promoter mutations found in other cancer types. And we made use of the cancer cell line encyclopedia, for which we had whole genome sequencing data on 150 cell lines representing a number of uh, tumor types. And we showed that throughout these, 100, these uh, 150 cell lines, as denoted here, we could see that in bladder, thyroid, melanoma, CNS tumors, liver, kidney, mesothelioma, upper aero digestive tract, um, less so in esophagus, stomach, and lung, that we could see that these tumor mutations were found at a high frequency, at least you know, in a small number of cell lines in these lines. But then again, in these other tissues, we did not see any. And subsequent papers published after um, our uh, presentation of the data showed that, and this is, I didn't cite all the papers here, but there have been about, you know, over a dozen or two papers that have then now su subsequently looked for these recurrent turf promoter mutations in a number of cancers and shown that um, they are highly prevalent. These two specific mutations are highly prevalent in a number of cancers. Um, I'll draw your attention to glioblastoma, where it's present in uh, 80 to 90 percent of all uh, glioblastomas. Uh, melanoma, as we described here, hepatocellular cancer, it's about 66 percent. Um, thyroid cancer, medulloblastoma, um, a number of different cancers. These are the most common mutations in these particular cancers. And this is just to depict in a more pictorially that in these uh, cancers, melanoma, GBM, bladder cancer, and hepatocellular cancer, um, TERP promoter mutations are the most common mutations found to date in these cancers. And they are more common than BRAF E600E, and they're among the most common point mutations observed in human cancer. So this data really suggests that non-coding regions you know, of the genome as important in carcinogenesis. And so what do we think really this is, these mutations are doing? And I think that um, this is just a model. I don't think we've proven any of this, other than to say that, um, that you can imagine that signaling events, such as the BRAF B600E driver oncogenic mutation, EGFR amplification, other signaling events that lead to dysregulation of ETS factors, at least in the case of the TERP promoter, then allows for um, a binding of these ETS factors to the TERP promoter, which drives telomerase. Um, and this is clearly, you know, just a model and just an idea, a hypothesis of how this might work. And you can imagine that this is another model for just how non-coding mutations or promoter mutations in the human genome could act uh, in cooperation with upstream signaling events. Just in summary, TERP promoter mutations are the most common mutations in melanoma and in many other cancer types. They're the first recurrent somatic mutations in a promoter in cancer, and they are uh, among the most common mutations in all of cancer. These uh, data implicate non-coding regions of the genome as important in carcinogenesis, and based on their specificity, you could say that you could imagine that TERP promoter mutations may be a useful biomarker for the detection of cancer. And I really do think that um, we should reconsider TURD as a therapeutic target. Thank you. So the, the specificity of that motif, uh, together with the restricted cancer sites where you found it, might suggest that there is a particular family member that is like that motif. Well, I think it will depend on the t tissue type. I think that, you know, we know that ETV1 is, is dysregulated in melanomas, for instance, and so ETV1 can certainly recognize an ETS binding site. Um, we haven't proven that that's the one that's binding at the TERP promoter. Um, so I think that those are, those are remaining questions that need to be Bruce? Oh, I just wanted to ask you, what, what about the biology? What happens in the tumors that have it if you, if you knock it out and if you put it in the tumors that don't have it, what happens to them? 
Do they, is it associated with aggressiveness or any particular biology? Right, so on, um, what I haven't mentioned here is that a number of papers published since uh, in this past year have looked at that question and have shown that at least in certain cancers, I think there's data in glioblastoma and in bladder cancer that they seem to be more aggressive and they have a lower, that patients have, can seem to have a lower overall survival if they have the mutation. Um, so I think that that data is still coming out and people are looking at their data sets to find these correlations. So in those cases where there's a high frequency of these mutations, when there's also well identified preneoplastic or benign lesions, what's the frequency of the mutations in those subtypes? It's a great question. You know, I think what we know is that, um, for instance, benign melanocytic nevi, about you know, 60, 70 percent of them have VRAP mutations, right? So um, in the small numbers that I've seen of people who've published um, looking at melanocytic nevi, none of them have TERP proponent mutations. A group out of France um, published about uh, looking at, they have a collection of benign hepatic adenomas, then cirrhotic, you know, pre-neoplastic nodules, and then the actual HCC, and they found none in the adenomas, and then an increased number in the cirrhotic lesions, and then, you know, 50 to 60 percent in your HCCs. So it seems to be a um, clear mechanism for transition. At least that's what the data would suggest. Did you say that you have not identified any transcription factors as yet that bind to that region? Correct. I mean, I think we have not specifically found the, the, the transcription factor or transcription factors that bind to that specific region in the TERP promoter. Yeah. Do you, what else are we missing in cancer genomes uh, in, <laughs> in the non-cutting region? Because we, you know, like lots lot. of groups I mean, have looked very carefully, you know, there are hundreds of patients that have the whole genome sequenced, and this is really the only one. I mean, this is a great find, but, you know, is it unique to this particular promoter, or are we, are we missing, are missing others? Can you, can you? Uh, well, no, I mean, I think. I think, right, I think that, the, I, I would agree with you. I think that there will be other treasures to find in these non-coding regions. Um, this telomerase is clearly a special gene, and will something come out as 90% mutated? I don't know, but uh, I'm sure there certainly will be other ones.